got green light. I think we're going to die. <laughs> Exactly what happened to me last night. <laughs> so uh, I know uh, you probably didn't expect to see me here, but none of you are more surprised than I am. Uh, my, my family and I, we had the privilege to go to the, the Carolina game last night, and I don't know what color you cheer for one way or the other, but it did not go in my favor. Uh, so about halfway through the game, my phone rings, and I look down, and it's a number I do not recognize. And most of the time, I would just hit the, you know, the go on button and, and let it pass. But I answered the phone, and uh, the person on the other side said, hey, is this Jerry? And normally, I would have taken that opportunity, because uh, I thought it was a telemarketer, to um, start messing with them, you know, something like that. You know, I don't know if you guys do the same thing, but, you know, I just, I just start leaving as far down the road as I can. Uh, he said, hey, this is Justin from, from Cedar Fork. And uh, hey, our uh, uh, inner pastor is not feeling well. Would you, would you be able to come preach tomorrow? Would you? Uh, <clears throat> actually, he asked me if I had anywhere I could talk. And there were 22,000 people around me last night. And I'm like, we don't have to talk here. Um, so he asked, and uh, you know, I look at my wife, and I'm like, inner preacher, see the fourth part. And uh, she's, uh, she's okay. She said, uh, Timothy writes, he says, preach the word uh, and be instant in season or out of season. Uh, be ready. Uh, be ready all the time. Uh, we change that in our house a little bit. Uh, we say, if, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. And we try to apply that to everything. Now, not, not just our Christian walk, but uh, life. You know, our, my daughter's an athlete. And, uh, you know, don't, don't goof off when you get out there. If you're, if you're ready to go all the time, then you're ready to go all the time. So uh, we're here this morning, and we watched that ball game last night. And uh, like I said, it didn't it didn't go the way I wanted it to go. Uh, I left there with with some, I would say, maybe not anger, not not anger, but some some at least moderately hurt feelings. And as we're walking out, there's like I said, there's there's twenty two thousand people, about twenty two thousand people in this building. Everybody leaves at the same time. And some people get to the parking lot faster than others. And as we're getting to the parking lot, we're coming through the parking lot. There's a, a guy driving through the parking lot. He's got his window down, and uh, he's wearing a, a Duke sweatshirt. And he and another guy who's outside the car start jawing at one another. They start saying some pretty nasty things to one another. And actually, they invite, you know, hey, I'll meet you outside the car if you want me to. And I mean, it, it started to get kind of kind of an unpleasant situation. And the car moved on down the parking lot, and the guy left his window down, and as we're walking past, there's the people that are having the conversation are, are a little bit in front of us, and a guy turns and he, he spits in the other person's window. And um, I would have probably gotten a little bit of trouble last night, but it didn't mean, um, and I'm not a tough guy or a bad guy, but yeah, I just, you know, that's, that's not okay. Um, but as I was driving home, I, I was I kind of started to try to process, you know, what was so bad in this young man's life that would make him do something, that would make him spit there. I mean, it surely it couldn't be just the result of that. Um, I mean, then, like I said, my feelings were hurt, but. It wasn't something that was going to change my life one way or the other. It didn't have that much influence on, on what was going on. So I, I kind of started to think that there has to be something else. There's, there has to be some other contributing factor to, I mean, why was this young man so bent out of shape? And we all have been bent out of shape, right? We all have reasons. So if, if you have your Bible, if you'll turn with me, we're going to look at some scripture that I am confident you are super familiar with. Uh, we probably teach it more in, in Sunday school to young children uh, than we do everybody else, uh, just because it's kind of a fascinating story. But we're going to be in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17, and we're going to talk about uh, the interaction between David, Saul, uh, Saul's army, and, and ultimately Goliath. 
Uh, and we teach this to kids all the time because it's just such a fascinating story. But we all have uh, an incredible number of giants in our life that, that we encounter and we run into. So um, as you're making your way there, I'm going to read verses 1, 2, 4, and 32 because that's made sense, right? First um, Samuel chapter 17, verse 1, it says, Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle and were assembled at Soka, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Soka and Azekah, and Ephes de Men. Saul and the men of Israel were encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in the battle array against the Philistines. Verse 4 says, And a champion went out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span, almost ten feet. And verse 32, it says, David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail, because the Philistine, your servant, will go out and fight you. Now, what are the giants that you face today? It's a number of things. Uh, people are, are facing debt. You're facing disease, uh, abandonment, uh, addiction issues, <coughs> broken relationships, inabilities, uh, weakness, past failures, discouragement, there, there are a ton of things. And your giant stands on the other battle line and, and they shout at you that says, you're, you're not good enough for that. You're not good enough. You, you can't pay your bills. God doesn't love you. You're not going to win your children back. You're not going to overcome addiction. The giant stands there. Your, your life is a mistake. You don't have a bright future. And the giant shouts from the other battle line repeatedly these things that are, are there to discourage you, to distract you, and, and to take away from you. Now, David taught us how to face our giants. David gave us a set of instructions. And, and the first line in the set of instructions he gives us is, is we have to plug into our power source. So we're going to find that down in verse 37. Uh, in verse 37 it says, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. Saul said to David, Go and the Lord be with you. Now David did not say, I have delivered flocks from the bear or the lion. He knew where deliverance came from. He said, the Lord who delivered me. The Lord is the source of David's power. All of our, uh, our I don't know if any of you are gadget people. I'm, I'm, a, I'm kitchen gadget people. I like kitchen gadgets. I like, uh, I like to be in the kitchen. Um, I like to annihilate the kitchen. And uh, I, I like gadgety things. But they don't work unless you plug them in. None of those gadgets work unless you plug them in. You go through, you plug them all in. And, and when you give them power, uh, they become efficient. Uh, they, become, they do the things that they're designed to do. We're the same way. When we plug into God's power, that's when we start to do the things that we're designed to do. And you see there, there are multiple people in this story that were plugged into God's power. The first person that was plugged into God's power in this story was Saul. Uh, the Israelites were like, hey, we, just, we want a king so bad. And God was like, no, you don't. You do not want a king. Of all the things you want, you don't want a king. You've got me. They're like, no, we really, really, really want a king. And he starts to tell them, you know, if you have a king through, through, through the mouth of God's speaker, he says, if you have a king, he's going to take your sons and he's going to put them in the army. He's going to send them off the road. And he's going to take your daughters and he's going to make, your, make them servants. And he's going to take the money that you work hard for and he's going to take it and put it in his pockets. Now, we really want a king. Now, if anybody were to tell you that, like, you know, how, how could you convince yourself? No, we just, everybody else has a king, we want one. And how many times do you do that in your own life? Well, everybody else has got one, I kind of want one, right? I want, I want what they have, it's got to be good. And God told them over and over and over again, you don't want a king. But God relented and gave them a king. And not only did he give them a king, he anointed that king. He chose, he said, this guy, this man, Saul, Saul is going to be your king. And the Lord uh, appointed them, and, and they didn't just, uh, you know, we, we still anoint people with oil today. I'm sure you guys maybe do, we do. We, we take our little finger and we put a little dot of oil on their forehead or the back of their head. That's not what they did then. They, they took a whole, all of them, the whole bucket of oil, 
and and they chose Saul, and God said, this is, this is your guy, and they anointed him with oil, and they poured the oil, and the oil uh, ran down him, and, and that's how he came to power. That it says, uh, the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you in power, and you will prophesy with them, and you will be changed into a different person. And Saul was changed into a different person because he was the one that God appointed. Now, all those appliances in my house, I at any time have the authority to unplug them. I can unplug those appliances and I can render them useless. Once you plug into God's power, I cannot unplug you. You're plugged in. You, however, have the ability to unplug yourself. You're the only one that can reach around there, grab that cord, pull it out, and say, I'm And that's exactly what Saul did. Saul chose, made a hard choice that I... I'm going to be disobedient to God. Now, when you disobey God, when you disobey God, God is not going to just shut you off and say, no, I'm not with you. Because everybody in this room has been disobedient to God. I've probably been disobedient to God since I've been awake this morning. But when we choose to unplug ourselves, we become powerless. We don't have that same power and authority that God gave us, he granted it to us and said, this is, this is yours. Do with it what I direct you to. I, I want you to do these things. And, and we, but we can reach around, we can, we can just unplug ourselves and walk away from it. So, next, David came to God. David plugged into God's power, and, and he would follow Saul. But he didn't plug into God's power immediately. They show up at David's house. They show up and they're like, hey, man, I heard you got some sons. And uh, one of them's going to be the king. And they go down this line of, of sons and all these, these big, strapping young men that are, that are warriors already. And he's like, nope, not that one, not that one, not that one. None of these, none of these are written. There's got to be another one here. And they're like, well, we got to run. We got to run. The kid that's far, man. <laughs> We go get the bar, man. I'm sure that's not the right one. And, and David appears, and, and David is empowered. It says Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. Now, David was the one who was given power. He was given authority. And, and if you look at David's life, uh, he was not always obedient to God. Uh, David's worst enemy was himself. Uh, and we're like that. Our own worst enemy a lot of times. We're our own giant, right? Our, we're our own giant because we reflect on those things that that we can't, uh, we can't maybe, we, maybe we can't control. Or we start to compare ourselves to, to others. Uh, you know, I heard another preacher call it the comparison trap. And when you, when you fall into the comparison trap, you start to live in the land of Ur, where, where someone's house is nicer, or they're richer, or their job is better. And when you live in this land, you can't, you know, you're, you're your only worst enemy because you compare yourself to everything. You start to comparatively uh, align yourself to how, more, how much more sinful they are. I am exceedingly better than they are. Um, I go to the church often. And, uh, you know, we, we, we start to fall into that. Um, but God grants us power as well. Um, we, we receive power in, in the New Testament in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. It says that you should receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall witness unto me in Jerusalem, and all Judea, and Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the world. We are given the ability to, to plug directly into God's power through, through the Holy Spirit. And when we receive the power of the Holy Spirit, they're, they're, we're unstoppable. There, there are so many things that so many things that we couldn't imagine doing in ourselves, that we're not capable of in ourselves, that, that the power of the Holy Spirit will allow us to do. It'll push us so much further than we would. Uh, push, us, push you into uncomfortable places, make you answer phone calls in the middle of a basketball game. It will take you to place you can imagine. Paul says, any speech that comes out of my mouth with enticing words are not of man, but through the power of the Holy Spirit. God's word will pour out of you, not because 
of, of your own righteousness or someone else's righteousness around you or your own goodness, but through the power of the Holy Spirit. So how are we going to face these giants? We have to, uh, we got to choose the right way. You got to choose the things that are going to help you defeat these giants. And, uh, in verses 38 through 40, it says, And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put on a helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he said to go. And he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off, and he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones out of the brook, and he put them in his shepherd's bag, which he had. Even his grip and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near the Philistine. I want you to put five stones in your bag. The first stone I want you to put in your bag is the stone of the past because God has helped you overcome something in the past. Now, we, we're told all the time not to dwell in the past. And you know what? Don't dwell in past sins. But don't forget what God has delivered you from. Don't forget what God has given you in the past. And David, he said it before, he said, God, God's delivered me already. He's done it already. He delivered me from the lion. He delivered me from the bear. And, and we, we have to be mindful of that. We have to be mindful of the things that, that God's got us through already. There are things that you went through that you did not want to experience. But God delivered you through those things anyway. And you know what? There might still be some, maybe not hardness, but there may be some something in your heart that says there's still some pain there. There's still some tenderness there. But God delivered you through those things and in 1 Corinthians it says, remember the wonders that he has done, his miracles and his judgments he has pronounced. Forget your past sins, but <clears throat> dwell on those things that God has done for you in the past. Dwell on the goodness that he is. The, the second stone I want you to put in your shepherd's bag is the stone of prayer. Prayer is a powerful thing. And prayer is, is probably... Uh, it's one of the greatest gifts. I, I, am, I am grateful for the, for the ability to, to bring my prayers to the creator of the universe. To, there, there's no power greater than that. And, and I'm grateful that I don't have to go through anybody else. I'm grateful that I don't have to go tell my brother that, hey, I need you to say this to God for me. I need, and you know what? I want Sometimes I want you to say it on my behalf or with me. I want you to be there with me, but I don't have to go through anybody else. I think about all the time when, when uh, Jesus was hanging on that cross, and they said that the curtain in the temple was torn from top to bottom, which means everything was opened up to me. There was nothing between me and the holiest place where God's presence dwelt. Now I can dwell in that same presence, and I can dwell in that presence through prayer. And, and I'm going to share a couple of examples in, in my own life, and I am not more righteous than anybody in this room, and I'm not... Um, more powerful than anybody in the room. But I, there are two things that I've had the opportunity to bear witness to um, through prayer that uh, were absolutely astonishing to me. Like, and I, I don't want to be in awe of God. Uh, you know, I, sometimes I'm disappointed that I'm in awe of God because, because I just want to expect it. Um, but at the same time, I always want to be in awe of God because God is so really powerful. Um, uh, we, we worked with youth for a really, really long time. And we had a young lady... Um, her mother came to us, and she was in our youth group, and she came to us, and they went to the optometrist, and they said, uh, the young lady's name is Madison, and like, uh, her vision is changing rapidly. Uh, she will be blind very, very, very soon. Uh, and, and we anointed her, we laid hands on her, we prayed over her, and, and she goes back to the optometrist, and they're like, man, we don't know what's different. The vision is not changing at all now. She's not experiencing anything like this. And I'm not bending in. I'm not like snapping people in the head and you're healing. But I witnessed this. I got to bear witness to this. We had another lady. And, and this this is not, God doesn't answer everybody's prayer the same way. And I'm not, again, I'm not more special than anybody else. We had a lady come to us that she had to have an operation. She had cancer in her stomach. She'd never been in our church building before in her life. She came with someone who was incredibly faithful. They go back to prepare her for surgery. Like, it's it's just 
not there. Uh, there's, there's nothing to remove because it's not there. And again, I'm, I'm not more righteous or more special or more powerful than anybody in this room. And not through anything that I did, but I got to bear witness to what prayer did for two people. And, and, and dozens of people on top of that that doesn't have anything to do with being delivered from some type of sickness. But put that stone of prayer in your pocket. And it says uh, in Isaiah, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stable <coughs> if we're constant, if we're thoughtful in our prayer. Uh, we'll, we'll have, that, we'll have that, that power there with us. The next thing I want you to put in your bag is your stone of priority. You gotta have your priorities right, you, and those are those are hard to keep straight. Sometimes it's hard to keep our priorities the way we want. And, uh, in verse forty-six, uh, David comes out and says, "This day, the Lord will deliver thee into my hand, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel." Now, David wasn't interested in showing how significant he was. He wasn't interested in, in taking something and saying, look how great I am. I, I conquered this giant. His priority was to glorify God in what he did. That should be our priority in what we do too. That should be your priority when you, when you get up in the morning and go to work, whether you, uh, if you get up in the morning and you go to school. We're, we're told that we should do everything that we do to the glory of God. Um, Christians should be the best employees in every single workplace. Uh, we should be the most responsible employees in every workplace. We should have the most integrity of, of every person in the workplace because everything we should, we're doing, we should be doing to glorify God. Um, everybody wants a paycheck, right? You know, when we go to work, get paid. And that's significant, that's important because, you know, we all like to eat and live indoors. Um, <laughs> But none of that, all that pales into comparison what we should be doing for God. We should, every morning that we get up, we should go, you know, I, you know I want to do this, not for me. I don't care if anybody calls my name today. I don't care if anybody pats me on the back today. I don't care if anybody says good job or thank you or anything else. Everything I should do today, whatever it is, should be glorified. And that should be our power and our passion. The stone of passion, number four, put that one in your pouch. Stone of passion, we should be be excited. It's okay to be excited. It's okay to be excited about God. And, and I, I know if you, if you kind of dig back into, especially probably when you were uh, uh, a new Christian, uh, you probably want to tell people about it, right? And not, maybe not even witness to them. But you just want to tell them. You're not going to leave my change in my life. Uh, I had the opportunity uh, about a month ago uh, a young man that I worked with for several years, I had talked to him a considerable amount of time. And he called and he, he just wanted, he said, man, I just want to let you know that I dedicated my life to Christ. And it didn't have anything to do with me. It didn't have anything to do with my power or, or anything else. But he wanted to tell somebody because he was passionate about it. He, was, he wanted to tell somebody because Something, something good was in his life. You know, we should be passionate about what we do. And um, David said to Paul, we read this earlier, says David says, I'm sorry, David says to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go out and fight the Philistines. We should be passionate. Don't, don't be afraid. There's nothing to be afraid of. I'm going to go out there. And, and I'm going to fight this guy. And uh, in verse 48, it says, came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David. This is my favorite part of this entire story. When he came to meet David, David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Now, most of the time, we don't run to where our problems are. Uh, we want to get as far away from our problems as possible. <laughs> And that's just good common sense, right? That just makes sense. Uh, but when I see David and his passion here, he not only knew that God was going to deliver him, he not only knew that God was going to take care of the situation, he was so fearless 
that he ran directly toward the person that, that no one else in the entire army would even consider about. Saul, uh, Goliath came out to the middle of the battlefield every single day and said, send me somebody. Send me somebody to fight. Give me somebody to fight. And day after day after day, nobody wanted to take it to that. And David was so passionate about it. When it came in his turn, he's like, call my number. He beat feet across that field. He ran across that valley to take on the giant. <clears throat> the last one I'll need to remember, the last stone, is the stone of persistence. Why did David get the five stones? I had four brothers. I had four brothers. Was it four brothers? <coughs> was, was he not sure that that first shot was going to do it? Was he not willing to give up if that first shot didn't do it? That's how we have to be. Be persistent. Pick up more than one stone. <clears throat> you know what? It may be the first time <clears throat> that you pray for your child's deliverance that God works in their heart. But it may not be. It may be the first time that you go out and apologize for something dumb you did. It might not be the first apology. Be persistent. Be willing to go through it more than one time. Uh, we, we talk, you know, it's uh, it's almost cliche, right? If you get knocked down, what do you do? Get up, dust yourself off, and get back at it, right? And it's cliche. But I can tell you, and my daughter will tell you, uh, she's sitting a few rows back. Uh, she gets knocked down. She plays, like, she plays a couple different sports, but soccer's her thing. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with girls' <coughs> soccer, but girls' soccer players are dirty. <laughs> uh, it's it's terrible. Like girls soccer players are the dirtiest athletes. Um, I have a beautiful picture of her. Uh, she's a defender, and I have a beautiful picture of her uh, down near her goal. And there's a girl that has her shirt on this side, and she is wrapped around her throat, and she is like choking her with everything she has. And uh, girls, they're just dirty. And, but she'll get knocked down. She'll get rolled up. <laughs> And uh, she'll start to, to maybe complain about something, and I am a 100% the ropes and dirt in it, Dad. Uh, ropes and dirt in it, go. Just get up and go. Uh, because your enemy, and I don't think the athletes that you're opposing are your enemy, but your enemy in life does not care if you got knocked out. Your enemy does not care what bad happened to you. Your enemy does not care... What, what thing that has, has thrown you off track, your enemy doesn't care about that. You have to care. And you have to persevere. And you have to be persistent. So, so if, if, if that one bad thing happens, or, or if it takes more than one prayer to, to break an addiction, or if it takes you more than one time coming to this altar to finally believe it at this altar and give your life to Christ, be persistent. Keep swinging the sling. Keep your eyes focused on God. Verses 41 through 47 says, The Philistine drew near unto David. And the man that bare the shield went before him. And the Philistine looked about and saw David. And he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and of fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog? Come to me with staves. And the Philistine cursed David by his God. And the Philistine said unto David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and the beasts of the earth. And David said to the Philistine, Now come to me with a sword, and a spear, and with a shield. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of armies of Israel, who has defied. This day will the Lord deliver you into my hands, and I will smite you, and I will take thine head from thee. I will give your carcass to the host of the Philistines that day, and the fowls of the air, and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. In verse 47, it says, The assembly shall know that the Lord God saved not with sword and spear in this battle. This battle is the Lord's, and he will give you in our hands. But do not be disturbed 
by your giant. When David looks across that field, uh, wisdom says being human. <coughs> wisdom says that human on the other side of this, uh, you do not want to mess with it. I mean, this guy was a professional soldier. I, I think we lose that sometimes. Goliath was a professional warrior. That's what he did for a living. His profession was, was, was kill people. It was, it was take the life of, of enemy soldiers. And he didn't just wake up one morning and he was good at it. He trained. Uh, he became a professional, professional soldier. And not only was he a professional soldier, he was, he was, he was very, very big. And we can't be disturbed by that. Don't be discouraged by your detractors. How many people bet on this? David. Uh, his, his brothers, no. I mean, his dad sent him down there to like, bring, bring some cheese and crackers and you know, get back out of there. He got cheap to take care of. Uh, his dad didn't bet on him. Saul surely didn't bet on him. Saul was like, no. He wants to fight. I'm going to send him out there to get killed. But um, Saul didn't believe him. His, his brother uh, mocked him, yeah, his, his oldest brother, in, in verse 28, uh, back it up, says, he heard him speaking with the men, and he burned with anger, because David said he was going to go out there and fight this guy. He burned with anger. Why did you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the desert? Why is nobody watching watch the sheep? That you, you, that's your important job. That's all you've got to do. I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is, you came down here only to watch us battle. He thinks that his little brother David only showed up to, to see the show. Like we, we go to see the show. Last night, I went to that basketball game to, to see the spectacle, to see the show. Um, and that's what he thought David was doing. He thought David was down there just to see. You just want to see us get killed, right? That's, that's all you're in. You just want to see how bloody this battle is going to be. That's all you care about. Don't be discouraged by your distractors. In verse 26, David said to the men standing around him, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Who's this guy? Why are you letting him talk to you like that? I grew up with a very good friend who was a fantastic instigator. He liked to start trouble among other people. Uh, even among our our friend group. Uh, and that was kind of his favorite thing. He would kind of start jawing and be like, are you going to talk to you like that? Are you going to let him say that to you? No, nah, you can't. You can't let him get away with that, right? And, and this is what David was doing. Only David wasn't trying to talk somebody else into going to the fight. David wasn't like, or like you got to do something about this. You're not going to let that dude talk to you like that. Now David's like, I'm not going to let that dude talk about my God like that. I'm not going to let that happen. Something's got to change. So don't be discouraged by your detractors. Keep your focus on God. In verse 46, backing up again, it says, The Lord will hand you over again, and the whole world will know that there's a God in Israel. Now, repeating, his focus was on God. His focus was on glorifying God. And how he could how he could show that, that God was the most important part of this picture. And you, you go through this battle every single day. You face some type of a giant each morning that you wake up. It may be that you wake up and you're sick or you have something wrong or somebody in your family has something wrong. You face it every single day and it's so, it's so easy to focus on our problems. And it's so easy for me to stand here and say, don't focus on your problem. Um, because I like, to, I like to focus on my problems, right? Uh, by, by addition. But if, if we keep our focus on God, if we keep our focus on, on the deliverer, um, the, the sharpness of that thing, listing your hurts will not heal you. But it's okay to have hurts, right? Itemizing your problems does not solve them. Categorizing your rejections won't remove them. David removed 
the giant problem because he emphasized the Lord. We're, we're getting it. Seize the divine opportunity. Verse 48 says, It came to pass when the Philistine arose and drew nigh to meet David. David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand on his bag, and he took thence a stone and slung it and smote the Philistine on the forehead. And the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon the face of the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in hand of David. We have to seize our opportunity. David was not the only person in this story that had the opportunity to go out and battle the lion. He wasn't, the, he, he wasn't the first person, for sure. There were a lot of people there. They're, they'd been there for a while. The battle line had been drawn. He was not the first one. So when it's your turn, when your opportunity arises, when it's that time for you to, to speak the gospel into somebody's life, or, or speak Whatever it is down in your life. God says, if we bind anything here on earth, it's bound in heaven. Anything we loose in heaven is loose here on earth. So, take your opportunity to get Why would these, uh, there, there were volunteers. Why weren't there other people that volunteered? Eliab, his brother, the one that was trash talking and he only came down here and watched me get killed. Um, David wasn't even, he was, a, he was a soldier. He was an enlisted man. David wasn't. Why didn't his brother, who was a soldier already, why didn't he take that opportunity? The opportunity was presented to him. But he didn't trust in God. He only trusted in his own ability. Now, there are a lot of people, uh, as far as the on paper sense, there are a lot of unordained language. Trust in God and, and use your opportunity. Because you're not enlisted or because you're not ordained doesn't mean God doesn't have a purpose. Saul was the leader of the army. By his very position, he was he was in charge. Um, he was he was a war fighter. He was the king, and his responsibility was to not only lead. But his responsibility was to keep his army safe. And he chose not to. He had the opportunity to show the power of God. He had the opportunity to go out there and do battle himself. When you grieve God, you cause him to leave you. And that's exactly what Saul did. Saul grieved God. And he couldn't fight him. He couldn't fight his enemies the way he did before. When he stood in God's power, his enemies were powerless. But when he separated himself from God's power, he no longer had the ability to fight. Jonathan, his son, Jonathan was a warrior. Jonathan was, was a fine warrior. But his wisdom was keeping him silent. He said nothing, did nothing, and he was willing to fight, but he would only fight without God's leave. He wasn't led into battle. And David himself, the outcome of the battle always ends in those who depend on those who side with God. One plus God is an army. When it's you plus God, you, you are an army. And you are the most powerful army in the world. <clears throat> Last verse. 17, 15. David ran and stood over him. And he took hold of the Philistine sword and he drew it from the scabbard. And after he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. And when the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Not pretty. Not cute. Sometimes you got to cut off the head with his head. You got to cut off the head of the And this is, uh, like I said, this is, this is a, you know, we tell the story in children's church, we tell the story in BBS, Christian, the, those who are out there shouting, the giants that they're facing every day, they cut 
away. <laughs> Cut off evil communications. <clears throat> Cut off illicit relationships. Cut off bad habits. Cut off vices. Cut off alcoholism. Cut off dishonesty. You've got to cut the head off of your enemy. The next time the giants shouted, know this. You can plug into your power source. You can plug into the creator of the universe. You can choose the right weapons. Arm yourself with those five stones and you're slinging it. And go out there and, and sling it until you can't sling Keep your eyes focused on God. Seize your moment when it presents itself. And, and cut off the head of the enemy. Sister, play for us as we close. You know what your giants are today. I don't know what your giants are. But I know everybody in this room has something that they have to fight. I get up and battle something every single day. And, and sometimes it's my own selfishness that I have. Or my own uh, desire to, to succeed. Or, or sometimes it's just that, you know, there's a dark place in me that, that can be mean and nasty and hateful. And, and I, I battle that sometimes. So don't battle alone. Don't fight alone. If you've never been God plus one, if you've never been that army, now is your opportunity. This is where you make that decision. And if it's the first time, or if it's the tenth time, if, you're, if you've battled repeatedly, this altar is where you make your decision. This is where you choose to be God plus one, greatest army in the world. This is where you, where you tell your giants, where you shout back at them that you you have no authority. You have no power over me because my power source is from the Creator. And I hope today, as, as, as you prepare your heart, as you prepare to leave here today, I hope you don't battle alone. If, if there's a time that you I am open to speak to anyone in this room. I'm sure there are more people in this room that will be happy to speak with you, that would be happy to show you how you how you plug into this power and how powerful it really is. Uh, as we prepare our hearts, we prepare to, to lead this way. Don't leave without power. Father, I pray that in this time, I pray that I pray that our giants don't overwhelm us. I pray that we don't sit and listen to our detractors that that we would be willing to, to plug into you, Father. I pray, Father, that as we plug in, Father, I pray that we'll pick up our weapons. And when we'll know what those weapons are capable of, Father, and I pray that we keep our eyes focused on you. And in our focus, Father, I pray that as opportunities present themselves, I pray that we're capable of seizing those opportunities, using those opportunities as, as you would see fit. Father, I pray also that we are willing to do the hard thing. And I pray that we're willing to cut the head off of our enemy, Father, that we're able to, to understand that in our power we can't, but you are capable. I pray that we will leave none of our giants out there running around shouting at us, Father. I pray that we're willing to go after them. I pray that we're willing to run to work. Praise you in Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for the opportunity to invite me to your church today. I am grateful to be here. I'm grateful that um, I'm grateful I didn't hang up on that phone call. Because <laughs> it crossed my mind. <coughs> I'm, I'm always grateful for the opportunity to share God's word. And I hope God's word uh, went out to you today. If it wasn't for anybody else, it was, it was for me. Uh, so much. I'll ask that, that Brother Justin this <coughs>